This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about what's actually happening in practice. And um, I think uh, something that may be a secret to some but is well known to many folks in assessment is that the Canadians, in general, are doing a great job. In fact, way better, I think, than what we are doing here in the U.S. in many aspects. Um, they have different laws and different abilities to do things. You will find that the assessment programs are generally, not always, but generally linked with the licensing body, so they are able to do uh, some more things. The next two speakers are going to be Andre Jacques and Bill McCauley. Uh, both of them are involved with uh, assessment programs uh, in uh, Quebec and Ontario. And uh, first, we're going to hear from Andre. And just as a, another uh, introduction for Andre Jacques, he is the director of the, um, please bear with my French here, Collège de, Med Collège Médecin, no, Collège de Médecin de Québec. Okay. <laughs> And, um, and so, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Andre is going to share some of the experiences of the assessments that they are actually already doing on aging physicians. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, we will switch gear a little bit. Um, I agree with Dr. Miller most of the thing, but there's always two sides to a coin. And I think uh, this will be the other side of the coin. I, as David said, uh, I'm coming from Quebec, and the presentation will be in French. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Just uh, to start, um, I want to thank my colleagues. who are five from the uh, Quebec College here, and uh, there will be two other presentations on the same topic. And I want to thank all my colleagues, and especially Marc Biard, who is my associate director, who pull all the data together to present uh, this present to to prepare this presentation i have uh, no conflict of interest except i'm a full-time physician for 18 years working at the college so i have a little bias there let's see what's going on in quebec as a uh, manpower this is the distribution of family docs and specialists in the quebec and uh, as april 2011 and that's that's a normal distribution, I think, everywhere in Canada. But look at that little part on this side. This is people, family doc and specialists, working over 65 and 90 years old. So that's concern our college. <coughs> if you look closely to those over 70, family docs and specialists, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of people there, more than 1,000 physicians. I'll put my glasses, it will be easier for my eyes. Sorry. Uh, it's it's a, a big concern for us too, because we don't know exactly what are doing those physicians. For sure, they are doing well, but we're not sure. If you look the trend, only the last two years, this is an increase of that, and you can imagine all the cause of that, you know, the, all the economics problems, and other problems. So they're coming older and older. So the board, because we're a licensing body, we just run by the fee of physicians, no governmental input. So we were bringing that problem from the board and from our peer review committee. Uh, that's uh, more than 2,111 physicians over 65. They are increasing number over 60 and 65. And 
as anybody said, the literature are there for some part. So we decide to look at our data. It's a retrospective stuff. I will not link anything to literature because my colleagues before me done a well, uh, well done job. So we look at our data for the last 10 years. We do 1,618 1, peer review on the ground. That was done by a full-time inspector, we call that in Quebec. You are doing in office, in hospital, in operating room, assessment of those physicians. There were 16 people for the last 10 years. We do about 165 peer review per year. We do also uh, review a hospital and we uh, test or examine the quality of the, pr of the practitioner in those hospitals. But this 165 was only individual that we peer reviewed uh, themselves. We use 70 experts per year. That's mean 43% of the peer assessment was done by two physicians, one inspector who is the expert of process, and one expert of content. And also we, we can have access to all the data that's coming from the government, billing data, prescribing data. So sometimes we use that data to also to have a, a picture of the uh, outcome of the physicians. We don't do any random or very small amount of random assessment. We do that on risk factor. And as Dr. Miller said, age is only one of the factor. You have a, a list of different factors that we can use during the last 10 years. And then we, uh, we look also our, so the, the, this retrospective study is all those visits done in the last 10 years, if we focus on those physicians who are over 70, what was the outcomes of that? So the first thing we have to put forward is when we announce a visit, we don't knock at the door in the morning, hello, you're lucky we're coming this morning. That's not the way it is. Two, three months before we send a questionnaire, about 20 page, about what's his, what are you doing? What kind of practice? What number of visit you, et cetera, et cetera. So we build our peer review team with the content of the practice that physicians already uh, send us. But sometimes we just announce the visit and the physician said, no, no, don't come, don't come. I'm retiring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe that's a little bit of insight. We hope. So we have the figure, 55% of the 304 visit that was canceled, that was normally be done, was, doing, uh, was done by retirement for the physicians. So what were the results? First, I'll give you a little color code for understanding the, last, uh, the next slides. So there's five level of when we come at after the peer review uh, of the, uh, we presented this to the, uh, the peer review committee and after we have four kind of things. The first one is cancellation. Yeah, like I just explained that before. But the level zero, the blue one is, is fine. You, no action is, you know, sometimes we send satisfaction letter to the physician, you're doing good work, thank you very much, continue. We maybe come back in five years or something like that. The level one is a green uh, color. You're okay, but you need some improvement in some little part of your practice. So we send them some recommendation. Could be two, three, five, could be 20. And that's it. We will come back maybe. The level two is the yellow part, is the, the peer review committee has concerns, but uh, yes, we can send you some recommendation, but we'll come back. And it, if the concerns are very high, we, we maybe come back in three months or six months. If the concern is not so high, we can come back in one year or two years. But there's a, a little control visit to be done. And level three is those who are very in deep uh, problem because they need uh, more intense interventions, retraining, limitation of their practice, or maybe think about retirement seriously, or some courses that you can, you have to do it. So if you're two and three, you're in trouble. If you're one and two, uh, one and zero, you're okay. 
So for the last 10 years, if you do look at that by age, you can see more green and, and blue for the first uh, part. But if you go at the end, oops, sorry. If you go at the, uh, the, the 70 and, uh, 75 and to 99, there's a lot of cancellation. That's the, uh, this one. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, gray, a lot of uh, red and yellow compared to the other one. If you focus more on the over 65, you can see that the, the more 70 and 75 are in more, maybe more in trouble. 31% of level three for 70 and over, and 37% of cancellation, 75 and over, and 21% of level three. So there's a lot of, of uh, concern about the, their quality of practice. And that was done by on-site visit, chart review, chart stimulated recall, could be in the operating room, it could be uh, anywhere you practice. If you practice in two, three settings, we go over the two, three setting. If you look at those of 80 and over, uh, the first part of the, of the slide, you can see that some have visits, uh, less than five years or more than five years, but 53% of them have no visit yet. And if you see on the other part of the graph, 36% earn $100,000 and more. That's not a slight practice. This for Quebec is a heavy practice. Maybe not in the state, but. <laughs> if you look at the control visit, so we have concern, we give some cue and some help to remediate their, 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 their problems, and we visit them after. As you can see, compared to do the two group, the 70 years old and over 70, there's a lot of red, I think is the, this part, 25% still have a big problem uh, compared to those younger physicians. CPD, so if you have a good CPD record, meaning that not only in quantity, but in quality, because we survey a cardiologist who was a senior one, and he has a lot of CME activities. But in fact, he was attached to the big uh, university hospital when he was younger, uh, and have all his CPD after he left the, the, the big hospital to do in private practice. Who was doing, uh, you know, general practice cardiology? But in fact, he goes all his CME activities was going to the tertiary care university activities and. In fact, was very good in stent and all those things, but in his own office doesn't use any, anything of that knowledge. So there's a link there for CPD. If you have a, not a good CPD, you see the red is much more greater and the yellow too. So there's a link there between CPD. That's not only for 70 years old physician, that's for all the physicians. But if you look with the age, you know, the not good CPD is the red color. You see that's over 65. The number of physicians who are not keeping updating their knowledge are, very, are more higher than the other one. Now, if we put them in retraining, because by regulation we can uh, mandate those physicians to have some retraining. It could be uh, full-time, could be half-time, could be with limitation of their practice or not could be focused on one thing or all their practice. If you look at the result after the training, that was it's not very good for those physicians over 60. There's a 9% failure, but <laughs> you look at the retirement part after the retraining, because they have to pay that retraining. Uh, imagine if you're 75 years old and you're going in retraining session with younger physicians uh, and uh, you're not, you know, you're not updating really your knowledge. It's a lot of, the 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 the, the scale is very high to, to achieve. So after the retraining, maybe you say, okay, I have enough. I will retire. So. <laughs> discussions now. Many physicians reflect on their practice at that time of the announcement of the professional inspection visit to the peer review visit, age becoming an important risk factor for us. You we cannot visit hall, even if I have a 
you know, I have six, now seven full-time physicians doing, doing inspection. I have a 24 staff person running all those things with uh, a big bunch of, of the budget of the college, but we cannot assess all those physicians because there's other problems we can look at. So, and also the fact that a small percentage of success after a, tra a, rec a clinical training program for those. What can we do? Should we encourage dengues to think about their future, have a graceful exit, less traumatic, and at the right time? Should we encourage them to retire, to avoid a clinical training program doomed to failure, or to protect the pu and to protect the public against incomplete or inadequate practice, or becoming other stuff like mentoring or, uh, you know, focusing their practice, retraining, as we said before, in under their field. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Bill McCauley, who is uh, the current president of CPE, the Coalition of Physician Enhancement. Uh, in addition, he is the uh, medical advisor for the quality management program uh, for the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, and again is going to give the, uh, the perspective uh, from Ontario. Uh, for those of you that uh, know Bill, you'll notice that he is uh, sporting a little facial hair uh, at this visit. Um, it is to celebrate Movember, Movember, which is to recognize uh, prostate cancer awareness. So he's uh, growing a mustache this month in, uh, for prostate cancer awareness. Bill. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think that uh, before I get started, I just want to, um, as president of CPE, this is my only opportunity to, to take the mic, so I just wanted to thank the organizers of this, of this uh, program. Um, the program's been organized entirely by Dave Bazo and his staff, which consists of uh, Bill Norcross, Peter Boll, uh, the Pace Cadies, uh, of which there are two, I think, uh, and uh, who am I missing? Oh, Sabrina Bazo, Dave's wife. Um, they have worked uh, to, to design this program for you, to bring it to you. I've been incredibly impressed on the flow of the program, so how they have started with, uh, with some very basic concepts and worked through some conceptual stuff, and now we're getting into more practical things. I think it's, it's brilliant, and I just want uh, everyone to, to recognize them now, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and the presenters have been phenomenal. That's all about to change now that I'm up here. But um, uh, you have to understand that, um, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to learn this from Dr. Jesty, that I'm 49 years old. So according to him, I am scraping the bottom of the barrel of my life right now, trying to get by day to day. Uh, uh, but things are looking up. So um, here we go. Uh, so the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, uh, I'm going to be spending some time giving you a little bit of background stuff because I know there are a lot of people in the, in the crowd that, that are unfamiliar with uh, many of our organizations. So you're going to have to bear with me, those of you who do know a little bit about us. But uh, we're essentially the, the provincial equivalent to a state medical board, sort of. Uh, we do many of the things that most state medical boards do, but I th think as someone else pointed out, um, we, uh, in addition to regulation, we also have a huge quality assurance mandate. So we uh, do a lot of physician education. Unlike uh, the American model where if you need a physician to be assessed, typically you'll send them to a great organization like PACE or, or CPEP in Denver or the, the K-STAR program in Texas uh, for, for assessment of their abilities. We tend to do it ourselves in, in Canada. So we've got a, a whole division of the college that does, the, does assessments. Ontario is, uh, is a big province. It's got a population of 13 million. As I say, it's big. It's really big. Um, it, it is the uh, greenish uh, yellow uh, province uh, in Canada, right beside Quebec, which is much bigger. And though we're right beside each other, but we couldn't be more different. Andre would probably say I speak kind of funny, but um, <laughs> um, we have 30,000 uh, actively practicing physicians uh, in Ontario that, that we regulate. The majority of, of the population base is right at the very bottom. If you look, I don't have a laser pointer, but right, oh, yes, I do. Um, Right there, that's the major of the population base. Up here, there's a whole lot of nothing. So, <laughs> um, we do a lot of different assessments, and our college is, is divided into two halves. 
Um, there's a quality management side and the investigation side, uh, investigations and resolutions. So the quality management division uh, does a, a lot of uh, different assessments for different reasons. Uh, we do peer assessments, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, we've been doing them since 1979. Uh, we do assessments for registration. So if you meet our registration standards, we give you a license. If you don't meet them, then in certain situations, we will give you a restricted uh, practice uh, certificate so you can practice under supervision. And at the end of a year, typically, then you you have an assessment done by the college. We've got the PrEP program, which is our high stakes assess assessment for family physicians, and uh, the, the equivalent to that for specialists is called the Specialties Assessment Program. We also uh, um, assess premises, so out of hospital premises and uh, uh, independent health facilities. They're slightly different, but they're essentially uh, when physicians are working outside of a hospital environment. And then if you, uh, in order to pre pre prescribe methadone in Ontario, you have to have a special license to do that, and we assess methadone uh, uh, prescribers as well. Interestingly, just a little sidebar comment, uh, we did a study looking at deaths related to methadone and uh, when we started to assess methadone prescribers, the deaths related to use of methadone dropped dramatically in our province. Um, so the invest investigations and resolution side, that's where the public complaints or the hospital complaints towards physicians' uh, uh, investigations take place. And obviously we uh, do assessments that are related to complaints. We will do inspections uh, of a physician's uh, practice when that uh, is, is necessary. The registrar, who is the, the, the head of the college, might get notified by a hospital about a physician's privileges, for example, and the registrar might do an investigation of that physician's practice. And then we also have something on that side of the college called a comprehensive practice assessment, and that's when a physician comes to our attention from a public complaint, and we need to do an in-depth assessment of their practice. That's what we do. It's very similar to that SAP or the specialties assessment program that we do. So by the end of this talk, we're going to look at two, both of those areas, and what, what I hope that you take away from it uh, is a little bit of an understanding of how physicians who are over and under the age of 70 are performing both when they come to our attention through a quality assurance assessment process or when they come to us as a result of a public complaint. So a little bit of history on the peer assessment program. Uh, we've been doing it a long time, and our, our peer assessment program is a little bit different than that, that of Quebec's. Um, uh, it was uh, conceived of in 1977, and started, the pilot started in 1978 to 79, and the reason, uh, the objectives of the program back then was very much a search and destroy mission, okay? So the, the, the reason for the peer assessment program back then was to identify physicians who are practicing at an unacceptable level to be able to provide educational recommendations and then to ensure that those educational uh, uh, activities uh, uh, had an effective outcome. Um, there's an article that I'm going to refer to by uh, uh, Macaulay, Robert Macaulay, different spelling, not related, um, uh, from uh, 1990 that looks at the uh, results of the program from 1981 uh, for the first five years. Uh, so I'm just going to go over that, and, and I, I just realized I don't have a slide on what, what we actually do in a peer assessment. In a peer assessment, there are a, a number of components. Um, uh, you you uh, are sent a questionnaire that gives us information about your practice. Uh, we match a peer to your practice and send a peer in who does a couple of things. The peer will um, uh, meet with you and, and talk to you and talk to you about the questionnaire and find a bit more about your practice. The peer will take a look at your office and your facilities and look at some physical things about your practice. And then the, the peer will go through 20 to 30 randomly selected charts uh, in order to make comments on both your documentation and your care. And then obviously we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that with the physician afterwards. So that, that's what a peer assessment involves. It's um, not comprehensive. It's meant to be a, a bit of a screen more than anything. The first five years, uh, we assessed 923 physicians. 663 or 62% of those were family docs or GPs. Um, this chart you can refer to in your syllabus. I won't spend a lot of time on charts because they're hard to look at, but it just basically shows that 663 were family docs. The next biggest groups involved were internists uh, and uh, psychiatrists, and then there's a smattering of surgeons in there. Uh, so overall, um, if you look at the 918 of these docs that were, that were assessed, you see that around 11% had grossly deficient records or unsatisfactory level of care. 82% uh, had no problems whatsoever, and 7% had deficient records but no deficiencies in care. Uh, th that's reasonably representative of, of what we've seen since we started doing this in, in, in 1979. Uh, year after year, generally, about 85% of docs have no problems. 
about 10% of docs have got problems that are related only to record keeping, and about 5% of docs have problems that are related to, uh, to the care that they're providing. When you looked at those docs, um, um, this is the family doctors, um, and, and you, you break down a few different factors. Um, you see that if you are over the age of 75, uh, you are much more likely as a family physician to have difficulties with, uh, with uh, um, uh, grossly deficient records or clinical care. You'll see that 35% of docs over the age of 75 from this cohort, from 81 to 86, had uh, significant difficulties versus um, if you're under the age of 50, only 9%. So um, uh, you'll see that, that that's quite a striking difference in, in the numbers. The other thing that came out, and this has already come out uh, from, from other speakers, is that if you are a member of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, that's, that, that's the Canadian um, uh, Specialty Society, uh, if you are not a member, then 18% of those docs during that time had grossly deficient records or unsatisfactory care. But if you are a certificate, meaning that you are a member and you pa pass the exams and are uh, continuing to comply with their requirements of, of being a member, then you only had a 3% chance of having grossly deficient issues. And finally, the type of practice, solo practice, 17% uh, versus not solo practice, 9%. So that uh, uh, was also a very significant difference. So these are some of the other issues that contribute to physicians performing poorly. One of the other things, this isn't related to age, but uh, we have since that time, since this study was done, used uh, quality of records as a, a little bit of a surrogate or a marker for clinical care. And, and this is the data that helps us to, to, to do that. And that's that, that there's only four docs out of 519 docs that had, um, had satisfactory records but unsatisfactory care. Okay? So the vast majority of docs who've got satisfactory records are providing good care. The opposite isn't true. If you've got unsatisfactory records, that's not a direct line to providing unsatisfactory care. There's lots of us that, uh, uh, whose records could use work, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not providing good care. Okay? But so, so we can use it as a bit of a screen. Good records, you're probably providing good care. So our current uh, peer assessment program, although what we do is similar, the approach to it and the, um, the culture of it is quite different. We look at it as an educational program, as an opportunity to provide feedback to physicians and practice on their care. And from time to time when we do that, we find docs that, um, that have got some difficulties that we need to address. We're doing about 1,400 per year now, so we're, we've really ramped up the numbers that we're doing, um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to get more than that. Our goal is ultimately to assess every doc every 10 years. We're not there yet. Um, as a result of the age-related data that I showed you earlier, uh, the only targeting that we do is for docs that are age 70 and over. So if you are age 70, once you hit age 70, we assess you every five years. Other than that, you get, your name gets electronically drawn out of a hat uh, and, and you have random assessments done. Okay, so what I did for this presentation is uh, we, we pulled the data from 2005 to 2009 uh, to, to, uh, take, to compare docs less than age 70 who are at age 70 and who are greater than age 70. So those are the numbers that were done. You can see that uh, in the late 2000s we, we were making efforts to increase the number of assessments that we do quite significantly. So this represents over 4,000 assessments over five years. About 60% of those uh, were age less than 70. We, we categorize our peer assessments or the outcomes of our peer assessment in three different levels. Category one, there's no problem. Bob's your uncle, off to the races. Category two, there are some issues, but they're generally just record keeping issues, and that represents that sort of 10% that I've been talking about earlier. And category three is that there are some care concerns or there's significant uh, record keeping deficiencies. And generally when that happens, we go on and do a little bit more digging uh, and do, do a more comprehensive assessment. So here are the results. This is probably the, the most important slide in terms of the peer assessment data. You'll see that um, uh, the, the red bars are the uh, age less than 70. The gold bars on the other end are the physicians who are greater than 70. And the green bars are those that are um, uh, exactly 70 years old. So you'll see that in the category three, these are the docs that have got concerns with their care or grossly deficient records. 9% of docs who are over the age of 70 um, have got problems versus only 3.2% in that younger age category. So um, uh, we think that this is reasonably good objective evidence that docs, once they get, get, get older, are, are performing a, a little bit more poorly on our peer assessment anyway. 
there's, I've just got three slides here just showing you that, uh, that over time that hasn't really changed. So for the docs less than 70, the numbers are pretty much the same uh, in every category in every year. There's a little bit of a blip um, uh, in the age 70 group for the category threes. I'm not sure why that is. Um, and then for the docs age 70, um, uh, or over 70, uh, again, it's fairly consistent year over year that, that uh, the numbers that we see in the categories are, are similar. I, I also just looked quickly at our, at our PrEP and SAP, our high stakes assessment uh, data. Um, so our PrEP ex uh, uh, assessment program, which was referred to earlier, um, uh, is, a, is a high stakes assessment or a, what we call a level three assessment for docs that have been identified as potentially having concerns. So none of these are random. These are, okay, there's a problem, we have to send you off for a higher level assessment. If you're a family doc, you go to PrEP. If you're a specialist, you go to SAP. The PrEP consists of uh, an intake questionnaire like we do with PEER. There's a, a, a multiple choice question exam, uh, six standardized papers patient scenarios that you're put through, uh, and a chart stimulated recall, which is a chart review with direct interaction with the, with the reviewer, where you can get a sense of clinical decision making, rationale, and uh, reasons for treatment, and that sort of thing. It's a nice tool. The SAP, we don't have the multiple choice question battery, unfortunately, for the, all the different specialists, so uh, we just immerse ourselves in that doctor's practice for uh, usually up to three days at a time, where you will review records, you will observe uh, physicians, interviewing patients, examining patients, operating on patients. You will interview stakeholders that work with you or who's, who are impacted by your work in some way, and we do patient surveys based on the PAR program from, from Alberta and gather all that information back together in order to assign you a category. And the categories are one through five in this high stakes assessment program. Uh, category one is no or minimal deficiency, everything is great. Category five is an ominous sounding critical deficiency immediate risk or threat to patient safety. Um, and so these are the categories that are assigned in the, in the PrEP it's actually assigned by a computer uh, and in the uh, SAP it's not assigned by a computer but it's assigned by the assessor and the committee who make judgment. This uh, represents 35 preps and SAPs over a, over a two year period. So it's not a, we're not doing huge numbers of these, uh, but you can see from all physicians, uh, the, the, the average score is 3.36. If you're less than age 55, it's, it's three. That sort of makes sense. Remember, these are pre-screened docs that there's likely to be some problems. Um, if you're over age 70, uh, 3.42. Um, so you do, you do poorly. Um, interestingly, but really not that interestingly, if you're 55 to 69, you tend to do worse than the docs over age 70. And, and I think that the reason for that is that there's a, been a filter applied here. And the filter that's been applied is that if you're over the age of 70 and you've been assessed by the college and there's some concerns and we want to take you through a PrEP or an SAP, there's a reasonable likelihood that you'll make the choice to um, put on a fisherman's hat and head to the dock and retire. Uh, and so uh, many of these docs over age of 70, and, and we sit down with these docs and, and their lawyers and, 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 and talk to them about what's, what, what's the best approach. We, we, we bring our data from our, from our uh, studies that have been referred to about uh, uh, performance at PrEP in elderly physicians and uh, the likelihood of successive remediation. We talk to them about the cost of remediation, which can get in, in the tens of thousands of dollars. And, and very often these docs will choose to retire. That's less likely to happen at the age of 55 to 69 when people are still actively earning an income. So I think that's the reason for that. I haven't dug deeply into the data, but I, I'm surmising that that's likely the case. So the observations that I would make with respect to looking at this data is that compared to their younger colleagues, physicians 70 and older, more frequently have serious record keeping deficiencies and more frequently have care concerns. That's for the peer data. And that once identified as having specific uh, concerns, physicians older than age 55 perform significantly more poorly than those less than age 55, and that if you're greater than 70, that may not be much worse or maybe even better than those 55 to 69, but again, there's been a filter applied there. Okay. Um, what about public complaints? And we haven't talked much about this. As a regulator, a lot of what we do is discipline. So we pulled the complaints data uh, from 2005 to 2011, and the data that I'm gonna present to you represents 8,030 completed investigations that have been coded. During that time, there were 15,150 complaints against physicians in the province of Ontario. 
Um, and uh, at the time that I had this data pulled a few weeks ago, uh, we had complete data on 8,030 of them, meaning the, 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 the complaint file was closed, uh, not only closed, but all of the data with respect to that has been entered into our database. Um, so because of that, you should also be aware that this data is probably skewed a little bit towards those earlier years, uh, because it's more likely that complaints from 2005 are going to be completed and coded than from, from those that have taken place in 2011. Um, and we're also going to look, for the most part, at those complaints where uh, something came of it. So there's been a committee action. The, commi the complaints committee, or what's now called ICRC, has looked at the complaint and decided you have to do something, or you're going somewhere, or something is going to happen. Uh, that represents 26% of those 8,030, or 2,000 uh, uh, 2, complaints. And we're going we're to look at some graphs looking at all these things. Um, we're not going to talk about, about when the com committee has looked at, at the, uh, the complaint and have taken no action. That happened about 35% of the time. We're not going to look significantly, I'll show you a, a couple of graphs about these, but we're not going to look significantly at um, when the department, meaning the, the, the investigations and resolutions department, has closed a case. Uh, or, or resolve the case. So the difference between those two is that, that uh, when there's a complaint, there's an investigator that's assigned to it, and the investigator will speak with the complainant and will speak with the physician, and very often some sort of resolution can come, uh, maybe an acknowledgement of there being a problem, uh, uh, um, uh, an apology. Something happens at the, at the staff level that, that allows us to, the complainant says, yes, we can close this file. A departmental closure is when uh, the department closes the complaint um, for a number of reasons. The complainant decides to drop it. They don't want to move on. The complainant maybe doesn't understand uh, what the complaint process is all about and it's called the college because they want money. And we'd say, no, go to go sue the doctor. Don't come to us if you want money. Um, so there, those would be reasons that a, that, that a file would be closed. Uh, just also by background, uh, when uh, committees, uh, when, when complaints have been re resolved or closed by a committee, they're assigned into three main categories. So the issues that came, the complaint were either clinical, conduct, or capacity issues. Now, often there's more than one, but in general, there's a, a main issue to these uh, things. And in the clinical uh, issues, uh, they are related to treatment. That typically means currency of treatment. They might be related to uh, substandard documentation, consent issues, prescribing of just general prescribing and prescribing of narcotics, and to uh, uh, improper diagnosis. Similarly, there are subcategories for conduct and capacity. So we will be looking a little bit of, at each of these things when I show you the data. And finally, the actions that these that the, our complaints committee uh, can do is they can refer you for an incapacity hearing if they think that that's part of the problem. They can send you to discipline, which is as a doc you don't want to do because discipline is where uh, your 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 license or your certificate of practice is really at risk. Um, to fitness to practice, which is usually when there are some 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 physical capacity issues. Um, uh, sometimes physicians have been referred to the quality assurance program to do a more in-depth assessment of their practice. That's not happening anymore. Typically, the INR department is, is, is doing more in-depth assessments themselves. And we've got a new thing called a SCRP. SCRP stands for a Specified Continuing Education or Remediation Program. And basically, that means forced education. Um, so typically, if we think that you need to be educated as a result of a public complaint, we'll try to get you to agree to do that through an undertaking. If you say, not going to do it, not interested, uh, don't think that there's a problem, then the committee can, can, can force you and say you have to do this. And if you don't do that, then you go to discipline. Um, so uh, the, 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 the committee can also issue cautions, uh, which is sort of finger wagging, saying you should do this. Uh, those can be in written uh, form or in person. Um, and they can also just offer advice, which is what counsel is. Okay, so that's all background stuff. Now we're going to get to some of the data. Um, in, your, in your syllabus, you'll have these charts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the charts. I'm going to get right to the, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, I'm not going to spend time on the tables. I'm going to look at the charts, which show things a little bit better. So uh, the blue bars throughout this are docs that are less than age 70, and the red bars are docs that are greater than or equal to 70. And what you'll see is that when there's been a complaint that's a clinical issue, and there's been some sort of an action required by the complaints committee, that's what this cohort of physicians are, uh, uh, there are much more, not much more, but there are more uh, issues that are related to treatment, so that's currency of treatment. 
more issues that are related to um, prescribing of narcotics. That's the that's the the one that says prescribing dot dot dot. Prescribing in general as well. So they're prescribing issues generally in older physicians and treatment issues. And I think all of that to a, to a certain extent deals with currency staying up to date that sort of thing. If we looked at the conduct issues, conduct issues by age, and I apologize, probably that, 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 that label is not there that should be. It's the most important label there, too, because that label is professional communication. So conduct issues by age, when uh, uh, a complaint has been made and it's related to uh, an, uh, an issue of conduct, uh, older physicians much more frequently have conduct issues related to unprofessional communication, ungovernability or breaching of, uh, of undertakings, uh, and much less likely to be disruptive uh, and having money issues, uh, such as fraud. And no more or less likely to have sexual impropriety issues. Everyone's equally likely to have sexual impropriety issues. Um, and then we look at the capacity issues. This one is kind of interesting. Older physicians have, are less likely to have issues that are related to substance abuse, less likely to have issues related to psychiatric impairment, uh, uh, more likely, obviously, to have issues related to cognitive impairment, and interestingly, in this data set, uh, less likely to have physical impairment. And again, you have to speculate why that might be the case, and that just I think it might be the case that older physicians who've got a lot of physical or medical problems are more likely to uh, be out of practice or not practicing. That's just speculating. So if we look at the committee decisions by age and what the committee um, uh, has decided upon for these older physicians, uh, it's much more likely if you're an older physician with a committee that, that um, or, or with a complaint that leads to an action, much more likely that you're going to be referred to discipline. <laughs> Um, much more likely that, uh, that you will accept an undertaking, so you're not going to fight things, um, and much less likely to uh, just be, be given advice by the committee. So that sort of suggests that the committee seems to be taking these issues more seriously in, in physicians over the age of 70. Whether or not they're biased because of the fact the physician is older than 70, I think is, 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 a, is a, a reasonable thing to speculate. Um, if you're over age 70, um, it's much less likely for the committee to take no action. If you're over the age of 70, it's much less likely for the department or the staff, meaning the investigator involved, to be able to resolve your complaint without it going to committee. And if you're over the age of 70, it's much less likely that, uh, that the department or the staff will be able to close your file of your complaint um, uh, for, 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 for whatever reason. So the observations that I would make about the public complaints process uh, and that are related to age is that if you're over 70 and an action is necessary by committee because uh, of a public complaint, it's more likely the complaints are related to treatment issues, to general prescribing and prescribing of controlled substances, to communications issues, to ungovernability, and to cognitive issues. These are the things that people are complaining about that are requiring action for physicians over the age of 70 in Ontario. But you're less likely to have, have complaints that are related to issues of confidentiality, fraud, disruptiveness, conflict of interest, substance abuse, mental health, and physical health problems. The committee decisions, if you're over the age of 70 compared to your younger peers, you're more likely to be referred to discipline or, or to, to sign an undertaking uh, to restrict your practice or to do something that the committee would like you to do or not to do. Um, but uh, compared to your younger peers, you're less likely to have a no action, less likely to have a departmental closure, less likely to have resolution uh, between parties before it gets to committee. So things to think about for older physicians um, is that based on the peer assessment data and, and that of PrEP, um, uh, older physicians are at risk of poor performance. So things to think about and that we'll talk about more in the workshops is uh, sh should we be assessing these physicians routinely? I know that's something that, that, that we do and it's something that is challenging to do and it takes lots of resources, uh, but it's something that we should think about doing. Um, and we probably should think about doing that at younger than the age of 70. We use the age of 70. Um, if you look way back to our peer data, you'll remember that that, that really was a difference starting at age 55. Uh, so where that cutoff is, or if there a cutoff, or is like most things in life, there's probably a gradual progression of things. 70 is probably a bit a bit old, um, and we've talked about this for a long time. Whether we should bring that back. 
it's an issue of resources as well. So there's a lot more physicians practicing at 65 and 60 than there are at 70. And so this is an expensive program, as you might understand. And so um, um, uh, to, to start doing it at age 60 or 65 would be much more expensive. Um, but this information also helps us to understand maybe what some of the educational needs are of this physician population. So, so maybe we should be encouraging and designing, developing, and implementing educational programs related to professional communication for older, older docs. I mean, you all know that, that, that communication styles are taught much differently now than, than they were in 1960 or 1970 or even 19, 1980s when I went to medical school. Um, maybe we should be helping uh, docs to learn a little bit more about professionalism and professional regulation. Uh, maybe these docs should have, have specific um, educational programs developed uh, to help them to stay up to date with current management principles, especially with prescribing and, and, and prescribing of controlled substance. And we also know that these docs are at risk for cognitive difficulties, and, 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 and maybe we should be thinking more about the cognitive screening that we talked about earlier and whether that should be an, an important part even of, of MOL for older physicians. Okay. So uh, as Dave alluded to, and for those of you that know me, the first question that's come to, my, come to mind is, is, Bill, what's with the mustache? And um, um, uh, so there's a, 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 an initiative called Movember, which is a, a fundraising initiative. It takes place all over the world, actually. I think it's a bit more well-known in Canada than it is in the States, where uh, men uh, start clean-shaven at the 1st of November and then grow a mustache to raise money for prostate cancer uh, and, and for men's health awareness. And and I want to also thank Marc Biard, my uh, uh, colleague from Quebec, who's also sporting a mustache. His, he got a little bit late going, so his isn't nearly as unsightly as mine yet. Uh, but um, uh, if you're, it's, it's actually kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, and, and I just want to congratulate this gentleman in the back here who's got a... <laughs> got, <laughs> He's got a mustache to be admired, uh, should, uh, oh, dare to dream. So um, uh, if you get a chance, to check out the Movember website, movember.com, uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can search for, for me. And uh, Mark, do you have a page on there as well? Do you, have a, do you have a site? Okay. So you can search for us, and you can even donate to us if you like. So anyway, I'm happy to take any questions. I think Andre's going to join, uh, join us up here, and we'll answer any questions you might have about these, these programs that I think are a little bit different than what you do in, in the States. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joni Bomber. I am the director of the Physician Reentry Program that's um, affiliated with KSTAR at John Peter Smith in Fort Worth, Texas. And so we've been um, doing the uh, remediation part, if you want, or the reentry part now for about four years. And one of the things that seems to me to be a theme in our group is isolation. And as I looked at the number of physicians practicing after the age of 65, it, there's a drop in the number of people practicing, even though it's increasing. And it raises the question in my mind about if, how isolated they are, whether in solo practice or not, and how much they actually can communicate with their peers as opposed to when they were younger. And it raises the question in my mind, having dealt with these older physicians on kind of an ongoing basis, about what is their connectiveness with other physicians who might be able to, um, to mitigate this effect that we see in the decline in their prescribing abilities and knowledge base and professionalism. Uh, um, part of the work that I do at the college is that I deal one-on-one -on -one with physicians who have been identified as the most severely discompetent. So those are the category fours and fives and help them to develop education plans. And so if you look in my filing cabinet, in there are a bunch of struggling docs who are over the age of 70, or sorry, over the age of 55, they're male, and they're collegially isolated, okay? So it's not just sol solo practice, it's collegially isolated. So that's what you're talking about. They don't have the opportunity, they don't have hospital privileges, they work on their own, there's no one down the hall that they can talk to, and, and these are the docs that get into the most most difficulty. And so maybe we should be thinking about strategies when these docs are getting into difficulty as we do our screens of saying, you know what, if you want to keep on practicing, you got to get into a group practice. Right? You need to be working with someone on a regular basis. And our approach to remediating these docs is to get them working with peers in their practice. Okay, They have supervisors in their practice that help them to incorporate change into their practice. So that, that's a great observation that we can really learn from. I agree with that because we, we saw some older physicians or for example, surgeon stop to do surgery in hospital and go to the walking clinic. They are isolated in their group because they are not 
in their peer. So a well, lot of examples like that, so I agree with Bill. I might just add on a comment and, and, and perhaps a question because we saw in Bill's data um, the uh, professional communication issue and, uh, you know, makes me think of like the curmudgeon factor here and, you know, how much that <laughs> kind of falls into play that, you know, maybe these folks that are professionally isolated are not around peers for a reason and perhaps there's a way for us to identify those folks sooner and maybe get at them and I don't know if you guys have had experience with that. Well, it, it, I, I just jumped because there was a question on the floor to Bill. What is the difference between the ungovernability and disruptiveness? Because the link with that, some people we saw, uh, they are disruptive physicians inside one establishment. And then the solution for that hospital is to kick out that physicians, but he's going another one and start the same process. So we decided to help them. So we put a workshop with Maggie Dupre, say, helping the, the hospital staff, the, the chief of staff, the head of the department to deal with those disruptive physicians because they become isolated inside because they are disruptive. So Bill, what is the difference from ongoing vulnerability and disruptiveness. <laughs> okay, so I will, I will try to answer that, although there are probably people in the room that will better answer that because uh, I don't work as much in the investigations and complaints side. But I think the ungovernab ungovernability refers to, to, to docs uh, that are before the college that essentially aren't cooperating with college processes versus the uh, disruptiveness, which typically is what's happening in the workplace environment. Um, um, I, I just wanted to speak to Dave's com comment about the old curmudgeon. I think that that, um, that 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 issue of professional communication, remember, remember came from patient complaints. So uh, patients are complaining about older physicians that require an action. It's often related to communications issues. And I think we have to look at, you know, we talk about, talk about um, patient-centered medicine. Uh, we need to talk about physician-centered uh, assessment and, 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 and regulation. And I think there's probably a, a reason why docs are curmudgeonly when they get older. Uh, many of, it, uh, of these docs uh, are working bec but don't want to still be working. They might have to because of financial issues. There are docs that are, have changed their scope of practice. Ontario does have a scope of practice program now, so it's becoming less likely the case. But it used to be that a surgeon, if they had to retire in a mandatory way, they would uh, just go and work in a walk-in clinic. And, and if you're a surgeon working in a walk-in clinic and you really don't know what you're doing, you're probably a little unhappy there. Uh, and so that, that might, might make you treat the physicians and be a little bit bitter. So this is all speculation, but it all speaks to the fact that we need to look at the, the big picture in terms of why people are behaving the way they're behaving. George, is your name? Yeah, I'm George Carson from the Practice Enhancement Program in Saskatchewan. We modeled much of what we were doing on the peer assessment that Ontario was doing before. Uh, you described an interval for assessments that you said you hoped would be every 10 years. And my question is, is that chosen because that's what the resources permit, or is that chosen because there's evidence that that is an interval that appropriately correlates with performance? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's not what the resources permits. In fact, to assess every doc every 10 years will, will require significantly more resources, but that decision wasn't made based on resource needs. Um, and nor, nor, I think, is there any uh, good evidence to suggest that that interval is the necessary one. I think that, like many things in this area, that uh, recommendation and desire was made based on on consensus. Okay. And reason. The so-called so so level three evidence. Stuff. That's right. <laughs> okay. Some comments quickly, and then a question. <clears throat> First comment is that we, as a as a training program director. We look for curmudgeon surgeons. Just thought I'd make that mention. Uh, but seriously, the, the, the thing that gave me great heart in listening to both of you was the extraordinary high percentage, be they 60 or 70, who practice successfully or with minor change. So that goes against, I went to University of Chicago and the glass was always half half empty, but I'm glad it's really half full and I'm delighted. But the question I would ask is if you're worried about the over 70, and you are, why are we only looking at them 
every five years. Is that adequate for those risks? In other words, are there ways to identify or put up flags that they ought to be identified or looked at more frequently? Well, um, certainly we would do it routinely every five years. Uh, what often ends up happening is that uh, a dock is, uh, is assessed, and about about 20 percent of the docks will, high, have, will be category two or three in the peer assessment. So that means that 20 percent of those docks have something else happen. Okay, so they're on our radar screen. They often get involved in education programs. They might have to go on for a higher level of assessment. So uh, we're not assessing and ignoring. We're assessing and assisting. Um, and so for those docs that have been identified, um, um, could we do it more often? Absolutely, we could do it more often if, 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 our, if our members were, were happy uh, having their dues double or triple, right? So we already pay significantly more than you do as physicians, because this is all paid for by the physicians of the province of Ontario. Um, this costs, uh, uh, physicians of the province of Ontario pay around $1,400, I think, a year in their registration, their, their membership dues, which is a lot more than many, many states. And so it's an expensive program. If we wanted to be assessing uh, people more frequently, it would be a lot more expensive. So I think the question is whether we can develop other types of screens that could accomplish something similar to this on a more regular basis. And that, uh, I think that's a good question. Excellent point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.